Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks ever so much for coming. It's brilliant to see you all here. So I'd just like to do a few thanks, if I may, very quickly. I would like to thank Alison Horton, my co-president, Chantelle Arnold, who's been helping with all sorts of things, including uh, the Eventbrite, and also Mark Dennis and Colin Bunnell, who've been helping on the bar. Um, also, big thanks to our main sponsors, Pentagon, this evening. Thank you so much. And also, thank you to Creative Island Partnership, who are our support sponsors for this evening. Um, Hanif Kara, OBE. Um, welcome to Jersey, and thank you for being so generous with your time to come over here. I know how busy you are. Hanif is a structural engineer and co-founder of AKT2 Engineers in London. They are world-leading designers, engineers, and sustainability experts. Hanif is also a professor of architecture at Harvard University. I first met Hanif in 19, around 1993 when I was working for Will Allsop. I left for Jersey, and Hanif ended up working on, with Will and my friend Christoph Egre on the Peckham Library, which won the Sterling Prize. As if one Sterling Prize wasn't enough, Hanif went on to win another four, the last one being Kingston School of Architecture. As well as being super talented as an engineer, Hanif has several other qualities that I'm sure have underpinned, sorry, that's a bad phrase for an engineer, underpinned his success. He solves problems but also loves design. He enjoys working with architects, and architects love working with him. He draws beautifully, which is a bit of a lost art nowadays. He has an infectious curiosity, which I think he's now going to talk to us about. So, Hanif, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think it's, I was explaining to Mike, I think I saw him 20 years ago when I was last year. So I've noticed a few other people in here that I've met before. When we were bouncing around the idea of uh, what I would talk about, it's very difficult to not be boring as an engineer. It's, it's a, it takes a long time. So one of the ways you can do it is by inventing a, a kind of theoretical title that will intrigue people. What can an engineer say when it comes to elegance, curiosity, or risk? Most of us will be re related immediately to risk because that's what we solve, apparently. So I'm going to try to largely um, tell you about relationships over the last 25 years be between me and buildings, me and architects, my practice and other architects, me and education. And I just met one of my students from 2004 in here. Uh, so education has been a big part of my life and the relationships of all of these things have resulted in quite a lot of projects. So the way I start my lectures almost always is what was the motivation. Uh, and Mike remembers this because we really had some great honest conversations about what was the future of design even 25 years ago. I was already sharp enough, bright enough, and entrepre entrepreneurial enough to know there was money to make because architects had given away all their work to people like me. You kind of sliced it into all sorts of NG techs, engineers, facade engineers, today's placemakers, sustainability experts. And my dilemma was really, I, d I never want to be an architect, but it's quite an easy thing to do to get money out of them because they really give it all away. That's how it works. And my goal was really motivated by bringing back the right-hand side of the slide to the left again, because I was also fascinated by construction. So I was a builder type of engineer, and I always knew that, that these, all of these other thin slices that you work with don't actually know how to construct anything. And most architects struggle. So the goal was really to bring together construction with a deeper thinking on how design as an engineering subject could work. In those days, um, the diagrams changed. Value, efficiency, and complexity were thought of as the three axes in which we all work. Um, and I would already had this, instead of the flat diagram of X and Y that most engineers used, I was already exposed to the AA at teaching and was thinking in the third dimension. Up until that point, I'd never thought in the third dimension. So the diagram that I created for our office was really values, complexity, and efficiency. This has changed about 10 years ago. 
The green box that you see is the zone of compromise. Basically, technical, technological efficiency is one of the goals, structural efficiency is another, and perhaps value by, by spending a lot of money on QSs is the third one. What I thought was there's a compromise zone when if I operate or we as a company operate in that zone, the green box, there's nobody else in that space. It's changed since then because these values stay the same, but we've had to redefine them. So in a sense, the, the zones have stayed, the compromise area has become bigger recently because value is now not seen as a statue. We all understand it as a dance. We know there is not a singular definition of value. There's different ways of doing it. Complexity has become easier in many ways because AI and technology has improved quite a lot. And efficiency is now driven by our love for planet, which makes it much easier to deal with rather than the stuff we've been doing it before. So that's the diagram of the practice. And what more recently um, I've been saying is that the more complex the task is, the deeper and broader we as engineers need to go. I've started to define it much closer into a, a position of an interdisciplinary engineer. So the one second in, in from the right never moved away from being a pretty good engineer, never. So one of the dilemmas has been always whether you jump across into architecture or you jump across into doing other people's work. That's never been my way of working and the officers largely succeeded, I think, by holding that ground despite its challenges. I come across cross-disciplinarians, multidisciplinarians, and interdisciplinarians, and transdisciplinary people, largely dolphins. They are very clever. They understand each other, but nobody else gets what they're talking about unless you learn the dolphin language. So for me, it's not the way to be. I don't want to go deeply into this, but I can say that theoretically, I've also been thinking along the same lines with the school and the university that has been defining what design means, trying to think about hyper-connection between our disciplines as we go forward. Par partly, I think that is coming, I, I don't want to go into explaining all of this, but if you look quickly on you know, social impact, user-centered design, design for manufacture, manufacturability and so on. These are the terminologies that we're all exposed to and we all need to work to, but what is it that connects them? How can you still do this if you only did an undergrad or a master's in architecture? So there is a hyper connection that uh, technology is allowing, but fundamentally climate challenge is driving everything now. And the only real way we, we can see of solving that is the real transdisciplinary actions. And for that, you need to be a brilliant architect and a brilliant engineer. The brilliant architect needs to think about being a good engineer and the good engineer, brilliant engineer needs to think about being a good architect. That's what I'm going to try to show you with the work. The office has unfolded that into a very simple way of flattening it. So even though we're only structural engineers and you see where we sit in that constellation, out of 350 people, 50 nationalities, 40 cultures, we, we have all these other disciplines in the space. They're not multidisciplinary. We have architects, three or four of them, who don't want to do architecture or engineering. We have artists, sculptors. So these people are contributing to redefining us all of the time. And that's been the kind of pattern that we've developed. The problem, I think, has become, and I fully admit and confess to this, the hegemony of uh, technology has also killed us in that we have now developed, all of us, this whole ship full of tools that are not innocent. And if you imagine the ship with a lot of metal in it, the compass disappears at some point, it doesn't work anymore. And I think that's the moment we all reached in the last two or three years. The pandemic really has shown us that. So I think adaptability, uh, sorry, changing that and taking moral and ethical positions has become one of the dreams. I give you an example of what I'm talking about. When this came out, it was a new reality for all of us. Most structural engineers had a wet dream that night because when we saw this image, frankly, frankly, we all were blown away. This is our turn now, you know, we can do this we will rule the world and 
What a beautiful thing it is. This was a simple idea about biomimicking a bird's nest. So, you know, what do you do when you take something like that big and make it that big? Well, nature tells you you can't do it, but we were all doing this. And it's only recently that, and I've got many examples of this, I worked out the tonnage of steel, and if you make a belt 50 mil by 5 mil, it will wrap around the globe five times. That's how much steel it took to make this. You, it was about 40% of the world's steel supply at that time. So you look back and you think that exciting reality today was because of the kind of speech I've just given about technology and how we work. Today, I think there's another dilemma going on. This is a diagram from the mayor's um, panels that, that I'm part of. How do we get to net zero quickly? I know you're 30 or 40 years behind us, but that's okay. Um, London is moving fast, very, very fast. Uh, we have to now, uh, from a legislation regulation point of view, first go to a site and see if the building can stay or will be kept. Um, we are then expected to say, well, the second part might be you adapt it, you change it. But the worst situation seems to oscillate between don't touch it and build nothing at one level, which is large component of what a culture that's developing in London, against how do we actually survive? Is it ethical and are we not actually uh, damaging ecology by keeping very, very old buildings? It's a big, big debate going on. So what the challenge today is, is really driven by this, particularly in London, how do we adaptively reuse? And that part of it has made us another type of god again, because 40% of most buildings are suffering from the fact that they have 40, sorry, 40% 40 of the energy is, of all buildings is embodied energy, the materials with which the structure, foundation, facades are made of. So the contribution we make to the bigger problem that the built environment making is much bigger than we had ever realized. So I think it's the time again to reorientate and, and rethink how we might engineer these things. And one of those is the beginning of my lecture now. So that's the hypothesis for today. What are we doing about it? And some stories about curiosity, elegance, and risk. The first thing to say is that the oxymoron adaptive reuse or sustainability, which is an anachronism in my world, both are very upsetting for deep thinking architects and engineers. So our own way of thinking about existing buildings has been re-engineered to think about advanced or accelerated reverse engineering. Because what we're finding is going back to old buildings and with the tools we have, we're finding that actually there is a lot of capacity in the existing system. So if you reverse engineer, literally, everything that we did, whether it's the, the oldest building we've done is 1706 cast iron. We've just redone it. It's the flax mills in Shrewsbury, if you Google it. If you do that and you follow from that, the technology can be useful and you can do some useful things. I'll just give you one example of that in detail. 100 Liverpool Street with uh, Hopkins and Partners. This is a, a classic London building at Broadgate, built in 82, uh, roughly 80, 82. The first building to use composite steel construction and, and really a poster child of its time for all of us because Broadgate transformed the, the building regulations, it transformed much of technology. We've just re, this is how we found it, um, the way it was designed originally by Fogo SOM, um, and Hopkins were challenged in a competition to think of a way of re-engineering it because we couldn't knock it down. What could we do? It got on the short list of the Sterling Prize, which to me is quite an achievement for a building that is old and recalculated. The way we did it was really take our tools and understanding and archive material to, to look at what is the original frame made of, so what you're seeing on this diagram top right, on, on looking at your way, is what we removed. And then what we managed to do to extend from that removal what we left behind, which is the bottom left, 
we added some edges and we changed it from a box to a blob in architectural terms, which is unlike Hopkins, but it's a way of doing something. And what we managed to do really was quite extraordinary because if you know London and you know most European cities are struggling from the, the underground structures that we have today, which are some of them are hundreds of years old. So one of the clever things was really the tools are now allowing us to understand better the structure and soil interactions, how much we can allow tunnels to move when we unload a building and all that kind of very complex analysis can be done using the power of the tools. Equally, verifying what's underground, testing it quickly to make sure it actually is still alive and it can take a certain load, we have the, the tools to do, to do that. So the process was kind of different from when you design a new building in terms of going through each element and saying where is the embodied energy if we keep it and what happens when we add a little bit. We went through adding to the edges, re-engineering the bracing system because once you increase the size of a building in height or width, wind increases, picking out forensically where the columns would fail. So we started through going through each, thing, each column at a time, computationally, but also producing material to say how much strengthening it would need. So it went from what is on the left to the right. The end calculations were about 40% increase in net area. So that value axis, not only is it a better piece of architecture, but it's actually, let me call it beautiful again in, in a different way. So value has both increased the, the size, the net square area is still measured as a, as, a, as a kind of success meter, but also all of the other stuff that has happened as a consequence of that. I think that just to put it very fast for you, you can see the speed with which all this also happens because of the tools that are available on site and the material that's now, you know, we're not taking new material in. So that's the first project, very quickly, embodied carbon and the discussion on what does adaptive reuse mean. It's not a singular response. You have to think about it differently each time. I'm not gonna show you, I do a whole lecture on adaptive reuse, I'm not gonna show you that because it'd be really boring. But the, the, the other thing that's happened to this particular building is all the terraces and green spaces, the atrium, the amount of light we are now getting in is far more than before. So there are all these wellness factors that have improved, rented very quickly despite the pandemic. So designing for elegance and managing the unexpected, unexpected risk is one tactical move. My response to, to Mike's question about what is it you're gonna talk about Bloomberg's headquarters in central London is probably the most important um, project that gives me something to talk about around that subject. Prominent site near St. Paul's, one of the last island sites, probably the most expensive site in the world at the time when Bloomberg bought it. When we get to site, we discover all the infrastructure underneath and we thought this is gonna be difficult. When we get even closer, we learned that over 100 years, there had been tower blocks, other types of buildings, and it had seen at least four different types of piling life, meaning from 120 years, when we were doing tiny piles to a point at which when new buildings were built where there were large piles with under reams. So a family of technological change in the piling world is what we discovered underneath. The consequence of that was you can't build on this site. You just cannot because we've killed it. And this is the majority of the problem today in Western Europe. We'll find this more and more often. What's below ground is gonna stop development. When we started to look at the archive, you could find horse and carts and all sorts of kind of technologies that have been used. So you can see how much these central London sites have changed. The driving force, that came formally from Foster and Partners was actually to reinstate some of the streets and driven by what we said they could actually put on the, on the site upside down, they were able to draw these four blocks and create a, a pattern that I think is interesting. Just to give you an idea, the gray piles are what were on site when we got there, the red ones are what we had to insert 
to try and make the buildings work. So we have put more in, which you could say is horrible and uh, it's killed the site. But one of the conditions was that we would at least attempt to design the building for a minimum of 60 year life. And it could probably be 100 years. So the big sustainability moves came out of that. The other discovery which closed the site down for 18 months was uh, the archaeology underneath, it was at Londanium, so all Roman London was found underneath here with bodies and, and lots, of, uh, lots of pieces which Norman Foster has put back in to a museum at the base of the building. So it's, it was one of the biggest finds in, in a sense. But why, why did I think it was useful to talk about unexpected risk? It was because there are a multitude of them. You know, you have Bloomberg and you have Norman Foster, you know, both of them have positions on what, what they want to do with their lives, how they want to leave their legacies, and then you have to respond to that. And then you had the problem of St. Paul's and planning and so on. So the complexity of all of that as an engineer was quite scary all of the time because all we wanted to do is a bit of steel and concrete and just put it up there. But the complexity of that changed the way I think most of us think. And what was really nice was really seeing Foster and partners also going deep into their own systems, at least to doing first crude analysis in waterbeds and so on of air quality. Because what we were discovering is that we were designing a facade that was going to let air in, but the air that was going to come in wasn't going to be good enough for us for another 30 years because London's air is poisonous. So we were thinking that far ahead, the architect in particular, and the client who was patron for this loved every moment of this because you could see the logic to it. Um, very, very clever building, won the Sterling Prize. Uh, some people were disgusted. One architect actually told me, you know, with that kind of budget, I could have done it. I have to tell you, in my own opinion, only person that could have done it with that kind of budget properly was Norman Foster because he was in the mindset of Foster and Partners, in the mindset of that client and capable of pushing the agenda far enough. Most people would have been given the same budget and they would probably have made a pig's ear of it, frankly. The ceiling is bespoke. It's a beautiful building. If you're ever in London, go and have a look. The, even the exposing of the rivers became a piece of art. And for me, um, it was magical because you know we never thought that it was going to be the greenest building in the world. But even today, against all the measures, whether it's Briam or Estadam or whatever, it remains the most efficient green building as an office space in the world. The second thing is going in search of risk deliberately. With eyes shut, that's how you do it. It's always the best way. Be prepared to go bankrupt, because quite often that happens, as architects will know. Engineers design their way out of bankruptcy, quite clever. Fino Science Center, with Zaha Hadid, uh, was uh, conceived maybe 12 years ago. Uh, it took us seven years to build in the end. Maybe it was 14 years ago. So the idea there was really, it was at the time, it was an international competition, and, and Zaha's were one of the six architects shortlisted. And it was at a time when uh, she was still thinking of the single surface project. So the conceptual idea was to float a box, which in itself was the museum, have no columns. The slabs would be columns and walls would be slabs and all that. So it's a single surface system, which has no um, platonic description as we describe beams, columns, slabs, and so on. It's a surface. And how do you engineer something like that? 140 meters long, no joints in it. That was the conceptual idea. A big box that sits on 10 pebbles on a site, so it frees the ground. So why I say you go in uh, literally with your eyes shut is the first problem is how to draw something like that. Traditional sections don't work on something as complex as that. You get close to some sections, but every meter is different if you see the drawings on the left. The engineer is still in the world of trying to put grids on it and some dimensions. So you can see the, the brain leap that needs to happen in order to say, no, actually, we're not gonna get away with those on the right-hand side. We've gotta try and work as fast and as quick 
as the architect does with third dimensions. But we were able to bring it down uh, and break it into these pebbles, break it into a floor slab basement and then a roof that sits on top, which spans 70 meters by 120 with only four of the 10 pebbles going through. So it's a, slight, it's a roof that is completely clear, column free space. We went in thinking this is gonna be fine eventually. For three years, we were unable to admit to the client, Uzzah Hadid, that it was, there was no software that could design this. We tried so many things because once you put a joint in something, it collapses. And if you don't have a joint in it, as a single piece of concrete, it expands over time or even during temperature changes and kills the building and cracks. Fortunately for us, rather than jumping to writing software, we found a very good software company in Germany who were pushing their own work. And we were able to say, look, we've gone in at risk. Could you join us in trying to develop your software, Sophistic, to try and make this work? B because the minute we tell the client or Zaha, we can't deal with five lawsuits in German. So in a way, you need others who are willing to take these risks. And you also need trust from people like Zaha Deed Architects, who knew we were having some problems but weren't pressuring us to solve it too quickly. I just drop in a couple of drawings and some of the construction sequences. It's super, super complex, but it was done with elegance, with beauty. If you ever go and see this building, if you want to see what concrete can do, and this one gives you an idea of the scale. Self-compacting concrete was used because to make it as plastic as possible, it was the first use of self-compacting concrete. And I think even the self-compacting people who've been using it offshore bought into the fact that they were going to go in with eyes shut because that stuff costs about 40% more than normal concrete. And nobody would have them on the job if that's what they said. So we were all flying a kite in a sense, but you can see the outcome. This is the roof, which is a two-dimensional two verandah truss, clear, and only four of the columns go up. Beautiful building. Um, I still say it's probably one of the last uh, original Zaha sketches. There were, there were a few left after that, but not, not many were purely by her thinking. Testing tolerance at a very high risk. Um, so who has the tolerance? But not only the tolerance, but hyperspeed. And you have to do this at all odds. So I want to show you the Bjarke Ingels Pavilion at, uh, we've worked with them quite a bit, at, at um, so the Serpentine as the high tolerance and high risk kind of approach to engineering. First thing we need is like working around 24 hours. So they were in Copenhagen, we were in London, they also had the New York office working around the clock. So we invented an idea, we were competing with three other architects. First tactic was they'll come up with one idea, let's do 10. So that wipes out the competition because we've given the client probably any idea they had within our matrix. The second tactic is how do we actually communicate and sell each one, like it or not? Bjarke um, Ingels is, in my opinion, a master presenter, and we managed to persuade the client that single sinus curve solution was good. And, and he was even more buoyant about the fact that he could sell the pavilion and make it travel. Therefore, it had to be made as a dismantable idea. To do that, um, in about two weeks, all of that process, so for those of you who are familiar with the Serpentine, from the moment you get it to opening is about eight weeks. So you're designing, constructing, selling, uh, finding a buyer for the pavilion, all of those things in eight weeks. And it's quite complicated. So you have to be at hyper speed, and you've got to have developed a relationship between each other and other people that is subliminally actually trusting each other that I, I'm sure the other will solve their part of this and we will all put, it, put, in, put in with it. So one of the first things was we designed an integrated diagram for, for workflow between the two offices. Everything was done digitally because the idea was to construct this out of the thinnest fiberglass concrete, so fiberglass, because 
the, the conceptual idea was, how can we re redefine an English brick? Well, one way was to make it a void and rethink the Daist diagram, which used to be made of brick. And, and Biake came up with the idea that we should do it in com advanced composite plastic. So make a, a coffin-sized brick and, and then put those in. Now, all of you will know composite plastic, um, uh, engineering plastic costs a lot of money. So the thinner it is, the better. Every single brick, so you have to analyze the form and the micro thickness and thinness at the same time of every single brick, which can only be done if the workflow is set up like this. So one of the things is about hyper speeding up the RIBA stages of work despite the fact that you are hardly ever paid in the way that they, 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 they put it out there. So we're doing all of the structural engineering, you know, the bending, the actual forces, the total forces, not only in the form, but in each brick at the same time. Then we're also making it, because it comes as a string, as you will know, and nobody had ever made uh, these bricks this size. So whilst we're doing the calculations, we were also trying to comply with safety measures and see whether all our assumptions were being proven out in Copenhagen, making bricks out of these sheets, testing the loads, testing some of the bricks, so a sample 10% to make sure that what we were designing and analyzing correlated with what was coming out in the shop. I don't know what would have happened if some of this didn't work, but this, this is why you don't think about it not working. And this gives you an idea of what you're doing all at the same time. You're forensically looking at the, the stresses, you're looking formally at the geometry and the jointing, then you're making the stuff all at the same time. And the and only way to do it is really with very, very bright designers in the office from many disciplines, both offices, to really put this together whilst we uh, motor on and, and, and build it. The, the last part of it is really about getting value for our money. So one of the things about the serpentine is it's very secretive. Nobody knows who did what and whether you really had a part to play in it. So we had a very nice conversation with Biake Ingalls and said, well, there's a clever way to do this. And that's it, is we'll do a little drone movie with Big and AKT on it and not tell the serpentine with ourselves. So we were pretending to check the thing, but we basically got our brands on the thing and released it the morning that they were going to release the, the, the idea of the pavilion. So we didn't wait for the client to give us the client, the, the, the kind of attention or credit, we took it. Pretty simple. Same kind of speed, but in a different city in New York with Thomas Heatherwick. And I, I put these two together deliberately because I'm gonna get to the conclusion of this part. With the vessel, which is a, a very simple idea that Heather we came up with in a competition. Um, the, the outcome really was again about bricks, but this time dog bone shapes and steel. So it's an inverted, for those who don't know, an inverted step well, but it's conical and upside down. So structurally, it's all of the processes that I showed you in the serpentine, except this time it's permanent structure. It's not one that will move. Um, and again, all of the things that I just showed you happened on this building. And you could do the sections at every level, look at the tolerance at every, every point in the jointing system. What will happen as you're putting it up because it moves differently depending on where you are in that spiral. And also the most complicated part really is people. We, we had to fit 2,800 people on it roughly and look at, as, as you will all understand, as you, as you get higher up your weight reduces. So modeling not only the human capacity and human weight, but also the cluster of weight. So what happens if a, a bunch of uh, American footballers go into one corner of the top and dance? Because that makes the whole thing shake. So again, some of the tools from the Pheno Science Center and the Serpentine were essential in trying to make this work. Um, sadly, it's not gone well, as you all probably know, because undesigned, in the sense, people are behaving not the way we expected. There have been two or three suicides on this building. People go up and try to jump off it, or two or three have succeeded. 
which is a shame because it means that it will have to find another life somehow. So the two architects then came together, Bjarke Ingels, Thomas Heatherwick, when we competed for the Google campus. Taking, scaling up everything I've just told you about the relationship across the two offices between us and Heatherwick, between us and Bjarke Ingels. It's very different architects, as you know. How can we, in the middle of that marriage, still continue and try and be forceful about what we can invent for Google so the diagram was simple, you know, creating a habitat, creating a human scale, and then creating a new sky over it, a Buckminster Fuller idea. So similar conceptual ideas about what you cover to create a first environment and what you do to the second environment, which is made all out of timber in the middle of California, high earthquake. What do you do? Do you do a, a dome like, like Buckminster Fuller, or do you do something flatter and simpler? But today's analysis tells us that what Bucky used to do was inefficient because the amount of air you have to heat in, in, a, in a space that you cover like this would have been ridiculous and what you make it out of. So it's been a super successful collaboration and we've managed to, the three of us have managed to then build the London uh, Google headquarters as well. I can't just talk about complexity. There is a simple elegance which is perceived to have zero risk it's rarely zero risk. Sometimes the simplest buildings are the most complicated because the engineer is not really needed and the design can be done by the architect and the constructor will make it. But the Kingston Townhouse, I think, is one of these in that working with Grafton, I'm not going to go through every section and plan, and I think most of you will understand what it was about, about create a common room and then surround it with different types of spaces. Structurally, it couldn't get any simpler. You know, once we were told that the idea was to create these volumes, how do we put them together in order to uncover a, a, a grid that would work, but not only that, to actually tile it with a, the same floor slab and column in precast concrete, and then add the heating system within it. So the simplest possible elemental outcome from a, what is a complex thinking process in how they wanted to really develop a building that was for the city, the city's townhouse, as it's called. Of course, these diagrams are wonderful. They help you to, to win competitions, but they really annoy me. These pervasive, the pervasive analytical um, diagram that hardly ever work like this, by the way. But I just like to put them in now and again. That wasn't mine, by the way. I just should show you quickly. Then, as you, you know, the rest is history. It won the Sterling Prize. And we've gone on to build the LSC Marshall uh, building following this, which I think is an even better outcome. The most simplest and complex architect for me, in my experience, has been David Chipperfield. It's very, very difficult because he knows exactly what he wants to do. He, he has a good idea about light, bringing light in, or the phenomenon he's trying to create in the buildings. So often it becomes about combining boxes, far harder than, say, the Pheno Science Center, because that's about making something work. Here's a, here, in a solution like the Turner Contemporary, I think we looked at 36 different ways of combining boxes in order to the perfect light that he wanted and the perfect idea. So there is a misconception that there's zero risk in these elegant things. They actually involve far more work often in order to get to the solution, even for the engineer. Do you make it out of walls? Do you put columns in? Do you do a combination of columns and walls? But the, the nice thing about this project was that he stuck to his guns and kept it on the beach in, in, turn, uh, in Margate, which does get three meters of waves coming in at least seven or eight times a year. So for us, it was like there is no computation. There's no computer that can model this. We still had to return to old fashioned ways of measuring the, the risk of, of waves hitting hydrological models by making physical models in Warrington and then looking at the, the boxes that you saw, reducing them down to two or three, and then testing the waves, which is actually quite good because we learned a lot about flooding. We learned a lot about trying to protect buildings when um, water will hit them. The, the other transfer was the first use of 
self-compacting concrete from Fino moved across to a David Chipperfield building because it achieved some really good quality finishes. So that's the second, sorry, I'm nearly at the end. Um, in the simple world of elegance, even Zaha Hadid's Eli Broad Art Museum tells you a story because that was an international competition. And the conceptual idea was very simple. You're in the USA, don't do any curves. Try and do simple, you're near Detroit, try and follow car technology, because they have a lot of factories there. So the whole concept were based for this museum on a folded plate idea, a folded plate that would do the building as a, a structural system, uh, an environmental system, a light system. So it's a single surface again, but no curves this time. So the, the structural idea was really, how much can you push a thin sheet of metal and how much skeleton does it need to add to make, make this thing into a wholesome idea and make it all do the same, one thing do everything in other words. I mean, we made it all work, but sadly for us, the recession hit and it was either cancel the project or oversimplify it to the way um, Americans build their buildings, which is stick and frame. So we, we did keep some concrete and we had ended up putting a frame, frame back in and what you see is really how houses are done over there with plywood and so on. But the skin now became a skin, as you, as you know it today, which is purely um, aesthetic and, and giving the first layer of water, waterproofing to the, to the building. It's no longer structural, but it's really beautiful. So there was a huge amount of elegance and pride in trying to get the manufacturing from Detroit to, to get involved in this. But We've lost that, you know, the USA, the UK, most of Western Europe has lost interest in craft and it was quite difficult really in the end. We did find one fabricator who made the skin, which is absolutely beautiful. I want to finish, sec almost finish with four towers. The first one is, um, is with Hersa de Miram. This is a, the, the, the crowded sky of uh, Canary Wharf in London was challenged by a new idea, Wood Wharf, where they wanted a residential building. So the, the solution that um, we put forward in on reclaimed land was a rotunda, which on the face of it sounds simple and, and every city has one. But it was a very clever idea by the architect to put penthouses, winter gardens, sky amenities, clusters, lofts and amenities as a, as a vertical city in a way, or town. London town turned up, up, up like that. But more importantly, the circle was to allow everybody to get a better view than you would have if it was a, a rectangle or a square. So you don't have an east-west, uh, north-south uh, apartment. Every apartment is different. And the way we were able to develop that again was using some of the tools I showed you because the target uh, on day one the competition winning entry was wall to floor ratio was 50% more than any other tower in the world. So there was more skin on this building than any other tower, particularly the ones at Canary Wharf, which are rectangular extrusion. Now, when you're going to start with something that difficult and you all know how much skin costs, it's gotta be very smart and you've got to be able to convince that the value will come back in the way you will sell it and how much people might pay for this. So there was a lot of discussion as we were developing the idea on how we can create a structural system that allows this change as we go up, make the columns walk literally between, between rooms. So whilst we have some vertical load transfer by making differences in the way the columns actually allow this edging and pushing of the, of the slab, we could introduce some green terraces that I showed you in the previous diagram. So to do something like that, you also today need to understand that there will be 50 other people building around you. So have a good idea about not only the views, but the effect our building will have on them. And as they build, what's going to happen to the wind and the bioclimatic conditions on our building. Bioclimatic design has become a new thing that we are doing. It's not an environmental idea. It comes from mixing 
environmental software with real uh, wind loads and also understanding a little bit more about wellness and what, what creates uh, an acceptable climate. So macro and micro uh, to create a rotunda that I think is one of the best. The second tower is for a different reason. It's to heal a country. It's in the middle of a, it doesn't crowd the sky. It takes over the sky. Everything else is low level. This was Iraq and Baghdad, and we conceived it 12 years ago for the bank as a headquarters building, uh, which uh, was to act as a symbol for the return of the country in a way to give them pride again. And the architect Zaha Hadid obviously was selected to, to come up with this idea. The tower is very, very simple in that it starts as a solid closed section and reaches a point where we know that if missiles hit us at that level, we will at least be protected by the solidity of the tower. So there was a, many consultants involved in the safety of something like this. And then as it goes up into the air, we try to turn the walls so that the walls not only turn to face the sun, but they also reduce in the work they're doing because as it goes up, they're supporting less and less floor slab. So it's effectively a, an environmentally tuned tall building by an engineer and an architect, not necessarily environmentally tuned by an m and &E engineer. Clever because I think it gives a different view from every turn that you take on the tower. You will see a different outside in and inside out uh, view from, from the whole thing. So I think it's super sophisticated and right now on site, we're hoping to finish it by next year. Um, we had to design the formwork so the Phenol Science Center experience taught us well to look at what the capacity was in, in Iraq to design software, sorry, homework that will do something like this. Now, Mike said that I should also say something embodied carbon, and I'm finishing on that. Um, the, the two front lines, the, the global south and the global north, sadly, you know, countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and many others, are on the front line of climate already, and China, and many others actually. So the, the, the thesis that LSE published you know, is, is upon us, this was 2005, that most of the new buildings will always now happen on your, on your left in China, the blue dot, and some, some of those other countries that are growing fast. Most retrofit or most of Europe and the developed world has 70%, broadly speaking, of the property it needs for the next 100 years. So we're going to have more opportunity to retrofit. So that has brought us home in London to a point where two quick towers where we've added 11 floors to, the, to this one before and after shot. And right now, um, Finsbury Square, which won the Institute of Structural Engineers uh, Supreme Prize, which has gone from 11 floors to 21. We're basically adding onto these. And how do we do all of this? How do I stay alive and how do I uh, keep active and make sure my guys don't make me redundant and that other architects want to continue to work with me and think like this? The big project is the practice. How can we design our practice to keep doing this? And the fear of missing out, how can we replenish daily um, the curiosity that I'm talking about. I can tell you that the strategic response to that has been very simple for the last 15 years. Between scientific research and architectural or design research is a space that joins the two. And that's where we sit as a practice. And we do a lot of this through also sharing our knowledge, our ideas, talking to people about what we've done, but also teaching quite a lot so here was a studio at Harvard where we challenged ourselves to, to design some, a rescue uh, hut in Ljubljana in a semester and build it. So it was a design and build studio with uh, office architects who were teaching at the time. And how would we get it up there? The idea was that we get rid of the donkey but use drones. Unfortunately for us, uh, the, the winning project is this, but unfortunately for us, the drone company at the last minute let us down. So we had to uh, ring the army and help us. So we managed to lift the whole thing up. This is a student project. 
and it's been on the front page of many, many buildings, and it's been in a lot of films, by the way. The other way to replenish is really take an interest in curiosity, and Marina Tabassum's work has always interested us in Bangladesh with what she's been doing. So these 400 pound houses for, for shelter of the Rohingya made out of bamboo are a fascinating piece of work. And we brought it to London with her. So what we said is that the energy in these, the bamboo uh, structures is really taken up by the joint because they're still steel. How could we do this in, in other parts of the world? And fortunately for us, Nan McLaughlin uh, and Rana Begum invited us to build this inside the Royal Academy last, last summer at the exhibition. And what we found was that the UK uh, doesn't have the bamboo. So we had to bundle what we could get. This is our office working in, in a farm, trying to make it, trying to bundle up and load test the bamboo to try and replicate what had been done. And then we also 3D printed rubber joints and uh, plaster cast and uh, all sorts of other ideas with how we might do joints um, so that we could take it there. It was very successful. If you didn't go, you probably read about it. I've also been very interested in material research, literally. So cross-laminated timber is something that I'm fascinated by its um, popularity and uh, misinformation uh, that, that appeared last six or seven years ago that you had to be some kind of a specialist to do it. So only special CLT architects can work with it or special engineers. Uh, I, with Jennifer Bonner, I ran a studio in, in uh, Harvard for one semester to do a house and a tower in CLT, sponsored by a Swedish um, manufacturer of CLT. We went to Sweden. These students produced these two projects during the first pandemic. So most of it was done offline. And then because we were so proud of what happened, we published a book called Blank. If you haven't bought it, buy it. Not that I need the money. It's quite interesting. It tells you as architects, you know, it's not about the CLT manufacturer or the specialist. It's about you. How could you use this material if you imagine it as a blank, which we did in the 60s with concrete? How could you introduce architecture to it with art, with carving, and so on? You saw some of the examples. And then last of all, last spring, uh, uh, last semester, I was fortunate enough at Harvard to be invited to look at low carbon because there's no point just looking at making steel and concrete better, but let's also face the challenge of local materials. Unfortunately for us, Luma Foundation in Arles, France, has the facility. Our students moved in there. Fashid Musavi and I taught a studio called Sustainable Common, which was about urban mining, taking reusing steel, which Belgium and France are already ahead of us in. And in parallel, I ran a, ran, ran a seminar with, with the Luma Foundation to look at what it's like to make straw walls, earth ram structures, um, stone. What does it take to actually make stone buildings? Um, and that is going to be published this year. So we learned a lot about embodied energy, how local you can be, and a lot of effort goes in. And glad to say, we're not going to be recommending we all move to farms and that we build London with straw. It's not gonna happen. So that is the last one. Before I finish, I know Simon Orford's coming. I, I could have done the whole lecture, a whole lecture. These are just a few of the projects that we work with AHM on. And for 25 years, all of the architects I've mentioned, but in particular AHMM, have worked with us in the similar sort of way to develop what is the practice, what is the design of a practice in itself. So just an ode to that. I don't know how you got him straight after me, but it's going to be fun for you to listen to him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hanif. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, Hanif's very kindly offered to ask, answer any questions. I know Josh has got a roving mic somewhere, so if anybody wants to fire away, uh, I'll leave you to answer, Hanif. Well, I've got a sort of pre-prepared one, if you don't mind. 
Um, and it's, I suppose, seeing Jersey on the cusp of understanding embodied carbon. And, and the sort of uh, diatribe seems to be concrete is bad, wood is good. And um, I just wondered what you thought about the idea of, are we in danger of being a bit too dogmatic about, you know, worrying about carbon in that respect? I mean, is it the case that materials can be branded as good or bad intrinsically, or are there sort of more subtle ways of looking at the whole problem? Well, I'm going to be biased about it because, you know, if there was no concrete, there would be no me. Structural engineers, we love engin engineering with concrete and steel, but I think demonizing those materials is not the way to go. I think there is a risk that in this fear of how we build better, um, that's been the first tactic, is to stop the use of it. I agree that concrete is actually the worst thing you could do to the planet, but it's not gonna go away. It's the most ubiquitous thing and we've lived with it for 100 years. So it's better to actually see if we can find greener ways of doing it and that's going on rapidly. So within the next 10 years, there will be concretes. And in fact, I don't know if Roger Madeline showed it, but he allowed us to put the first zero cement pile on his site at Canada Water. So it will take some guts and some of this kind of techniques of going in at risk, blind and so on, to be first out of the gate with some of these materials. I would say that both steel is already getting better in you know, under Swedes are producing it with green energy. And if we use, not, don't use coal to produce steel, there's a way of proving that it actually is better for you because it does give you a hundred year life, concrete and steel. So this question of the design life of a building, in particular the frame, but also the facade, is a much bigger debate. That doesn't mean we shouldn't look again at what we could do with the natural materials that are local in the right place. And Al is particularly interesting because in Marseille, there are eight story buildings made out of earth round from the 50s. So there are places where these techniques will work. London right now is experimenting with cobage. If you don't know cobage, it's a, it, it's, cob but tested now with a composite material so you have two types of mud and you can have insulation with one and, and long-termness with it and the other layer doesn't do that plymouth university and normandy have invented it through some research so one of the students projects for us was to bring them in and make that material to see whether we can do two or three floors with it because the unfortunately for all of us in the globe in the global south the rapid urbanization, as we've seen even in Turkey and Syria, the problem of that isn't going to go away. We've got to find ways of people to live somehow, not in tents, but in, in what we might call houses and buildings. So I think the jury is out. I think we will all need to work harder and in a different way. And I, I don't doubt that we can get much more out of all of our existing buildings. But I think to demonize the idea of building new is also totally unhelpful and, in my opinion, against the, the deep thinking on ecology. There is a microphone coming. Hello. How do you, how do you see um, third world coping as opposed to first world in terms of engineering solutions for the climate crisis? In, in terms of? The climate crisis. Well, most of it is, is on the front line, even in parts of Northern Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So they're already finding it challenging in many of these places. The Middle East is finding challenges. The heat's going up. In Saudi Arabia last week, it was freezing, and they had snow. I don't know if you saw it on YouTube for the first time. So extremes are happening everywhere. I, I think that calling it third world doesn't help, in my opinion. Um, not, I've not got anything against the term, but having been fortunate enough to travel to places like Bangladesh and Sudan and so on, there is a, there is a desire to find solutions because they know they can't go through the things we went through. There is a resistance because in some parts the culture demands that they want to be modern, which means steel concrete. But I think there is a, a bigger move now because uh, the world conversation on how we may fund and help them fund 
more sustainable ways of making things. South America, I think, is in, in advance of most in, in these areas, some parts of South America, not Brazil. So I, I would say that they will find it far more challenging. And largely speaking, you know, I've been to India quite often, building a couple of projects there. They don't want us there. To them, it's like, we want what you already did. But by the way, don't tell us we can't do this. We don't care if it's not sustainable. It's that kind of com conversation. But I think there are smart people who are beginning to see that that isn't a good narrative for themselves. And it's changing fast in some parts of India that I've seen. So I live in hope. I'm an optimist in general that if we start from re-educating ourselves and the, the new people who will come into architecture and also trying to transfer some of that at the level of education first, then within the next 10 years we'll see the difference because it's the next generation's rights that we're looking to protect more so than ours. If you bring them to the table sooner and you educate them to, to the mistakes we've all made, one hopes that they will come out with solutions that, that could help us all, even in the third world. Yeah. I'm very interested in um, uh, the, the rediscovery of traditional materials, and uh, I just this, this tends to be a preserve of um, uh, historic buildings, uh, nutters or vernacular building freaks or similar. Um, and I just wondered uh, what specific things might be of, of, of interest to you. You've mentioned uh, cob or cobalt, which I'm um, very very interesting. Um, is there something, I know that there is experimentation going on with post-tension stone uh, buildings. Um, what other things are in the pipeline? The biggest mover has been cross-laminated timber and the use of timber that is sustainable. There are dilemmas because people don't understand that 10 hectares of growing uh, young trees to make CLT building gives you about a 10, 10 by 10 square meter of CLT. So it's, it's a long game. It's, the Scandinavians and some of the, some of the Canadian uh, people have already got this in their system so they can do it. So it can't be universal. It's not something you can apply everywhere. But it is inventing, so connecting it to the third world country. I did a lecture like this in South Africa in Cape Town and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, we have a problem in Cape Town. Our water has run out. All the eucalyptus trees have drunk the water. Eucalyptus came here from Australia. We're chopping all of our eucalyptus. So I've got it all free in my yard. Can we make CLT out of it? He's now called Exlam, and he is exporting cross-laminated timber from the waste in Cape Town across to Kenya to build housing. So I think there are entrepreneurs who are thinking of these things. I'm not a, uh, you know, I, th I can understand that if you want to make a name, you go out and say something like, let's build the whole of London with post-tension stone. I understand that, and that's going on, and there's a lot of support for it, until you work out that you'll need Ben Nevis just to do one street in London. So you start to work out where is the logic? What are the real conversations? Materially, I still live in the hope that how we re-engineer concrete, if you look up, you'll find a, a material called Ceratec, which is the first thing that we found and we made a pavilion out of it. It's made out of olivine uh, aggregates, which are abundant. They are not PFA, so it's not replacement of cement using coal power stations. This is a natural material that is almost close to Portland cement. You can make it. And this is at small scale, and actually the inventors in Imperial College came to us with a bottle, like a powdered bottle, and said, you know, we want to patent this. And we had to work with them to make it happen. They are patenting it now. They won the Nobel Prize recently. So there are positive signs on carbon capture concrete. Steel is also beginning to become better and better, particularly in Sweden, if you Google and look how they're now making steel, and, and the recyclability of steel is a very strong point. The Belgians and the French are taking it to an extreme in that they are already taking it from one site, cleaning it, and putting it on another building. We've just done that in London for the first time. 
insurance companies, mortgage companies, will all come, need to come on board with the reuse of these materials. So I don't see a magic material in my lifetime that will solve these problems. I think what is more hopeful is if we have grown-up conversations about how much of what we can do with existing buildings. I'm not really worried about the conservation people. I'm not, because we, we were lucky enough to do the, the flax mills, but we also, the Regent's Crescent, John Nash's building, which was grade two listed, and grade two listed American uh, embassy in London with Chipperfield. So the John Nash building, when we arrived, we weren't allowed to touch the facade or anything. But when we started to look at it forensically, we found that it had been bombed. There was a large part of it was, which wasn't John Nash. Some builder had just put it up overnight at some point. So we were able to convince English Heritage that actually we could redo it properly with lime mortar, which is what we've done. And in exchange, they would give us an additional floor on it. So I think there are people who are of the mind of actually being sensible as you come to a building, and can you trust the architect and the engineer, and also the, the developer often, to actually do something right with these things. So that would be my answer. There's one thing I should tell you. I can answer almost any question you ask. You should know this. I'm a pro at this. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so thank you for the talk. It was really inspiring. Um, and just seeing how you've really pushed the boundaries for taking an engineer into its limits is, is quite inspiring, so thank you. And just seeing how you have taken an engineer into that, that extreme, I'm just aware that often, most of us when it comes down to engineering and buildings are a much lower tech, where we're not pushing those extremes. I was th just thinking about that bridge between the two. How can we draw upon some of the things you've learned to inspire the buildings and make them better? And also, how can you learn from some of the, the high-tech solutions you found in the middle of London or wherever else that can inspire and help new buildings recovering from earthquakes and cl climate crisis? No, it's, it's an excellent question. And, and in the office, um, I have to say, you know, the, the latest graduates come before they join us, they ask us that question. We don't want to do as I did building. What are you doing that keeps us interested in, in the, the engineering world? So on the one hand, I have a flippant answer that anybody can, that can do what I've been showing you can do a simple building than most people who do simple buildings. There is no doubt in my mind about that because the brain of AKT has been pushed so hard. If we're gonna make any mistakes, it's gonna be on simple buildings. And so we are ourselves re-engineering the practice to make sure that the way we process, when we do our reviews, rather than do optioneering, how do we go back to, to the basics on many buildings? And of course, all slideshows show you the, you know, the, the, the trendy eye candy. If you look at the website, you'll see we also do lots of simple buildings, tons of them. I mean, there can't be anything simpler, by the way, than the townhouse by, by Grafton. It's like a simple precast building, precast frame, wheeled in from nearby, that was it. So my answer would be that you shouldn't be uh, disillusioned if you're doing simple buildings. You just got to do them better in a simple way. And we find that, you know, you, I haven't shown you some of the really nice simple buildings we've done. The RMEA climate change, um, quite a lot of high profile architects have resisted signing up for it. What are your thoughts on that? You know, every, it's an ethical position and a moral position that I, I think I would take. So I don't know specifically why some have said no. I mean, we can guess, you know, they're all big practices and they are working on airports and fundamentally wrong in what they're doing. And I kind of fit that bill, or my practice does, because we're 25 years old and doing lots of many big projects. The question we have asked ourselves is, if we suddenly uh, take up the climate challenge and run out of uh, work and fire everyone, is that more, th more ethical 
than saying, hang on a minute, this is going to take a little while. Let's start the process of how we will become more diverse, how we will do more interesting buildings, and how we will respond to climate. So I take a position that, you know, and I think there's extremes in both cases, you know, those that have said no and those, those that you wouldn't know the name of until they said, I'm with ACAN. You know, suddenly they're famous. So there's this extreme, but most of us have common sense, I think, and we're working towards ways of working together because I think most of us recognize that if we don't do it, the insurance people aren't going to do it. The QS will just wait until it's done and then take their fee from it. That's how it works. And then the others around us who are less able and less capable will follow if we do the right thing. But to jump to either extreme is, is pretty risky. So I haven't heard all the speeches from all of the people who've said no. I've heard a lot of people complain about them. When we got on a short list for the, uh, the under Liverpool Street in, last, in the last Sterling Prize, it got attacked on Twitter and uh, how can it even get on a short list? All of the, the woke people in, let's say, or even some of the sensible people attacked it for simply being on the short list. The winner deserved to be the winner, you know, that was no question. But not putting it on the short list, having seen what I've just told you, and if you walked around the building, uh, and putting other buildings on the short list isn't the right approach. You don't just give in like that. You've got to deal with the differences and the commonalities amongst these things. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping, uh, I've seen the work of some of the bigger practices who are not signed up to ACAN. Um, and not all of their work is as horrible as it's made out to be. They're doing some sensible stuff in some of the developing parts of the world. So I'm, I'm sitting on the fence, but I'm telling you that in the office is a regular discussion about this all of the time. We have done everything possible, created a, a, our own carbon footprint. I think if you don't know, we're the first B Corp engineer we, registered, we certified last year, last week. That is a pretty big move. A lot of investment to be, be caught in that community. Um, and there's a whole group of people studying bamboo and all this other stuff in our time, let's say. Thank you. Uh. Thank you, Hanif. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, well, and thank you. Thank you all for coming and for the questions. And, uh, well, have a good evening, and we'll see you hopefully on the 28th next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>